Hello everybody, in this video we're going to be talking about what it means to project one vector onto another vector. So we're going to be talking about vector projections. Now vector projections is one of those concepts in linear algebra that I think the geometry behind it can be pretty intuitive. The algebra gets a little bit complicated, it's hard to see how the algebra relates to the geometry that we looked at. And also beyond that, it's kind of hard for a lot of students, including myself at first, to figure out why vector projections are even important in the context of data science, for example. Um, I think that's because a lot of times they don't get taught in the concept, in the context of data science, so it can be difficult for students to see why are we doing all this crazy nonsense. So uh, with those ideas in mind, we'll first talk about geometrically what is a vector projection, then we'll talk about um, why it could be useful in a data science context, and lastly we'll talk about how to derive the algebra from the more intuitive geometry so you guys can see that they're not two kind of independent entities but one related topic called vector projections. Cool, so without any further ado, let's go ahead and talk about what it means to take a vector projection. What does it mean for one vector, one vector to be projected onto another vector? The lucky thing is that it's kind of all in the name. So notice that we have these seven data points here, all these little x's you see. And each of them is a collection of a x1 variable and an x2 variable, so they live in the two-dimensional plane here, okay? Now, let's say someone says, can you draw the best fit vector uh, through these data points. Draw the vector which the, uh, all the other data points kind of tend to cluster around. You would probably produce a vector very similar to this one because it seems that this direction, this vector here, is kind of the direction that all the data points are going in. It's similar to just saying draw the best fit line, right? Now let's say your next task is to uh, take any one of these data points, which by the way can be represented as a vector, Although I've drawn these data points as x's, for example, this guy is drawn as an x, but it's really also representable as a vector starting at the origin, ending at that data point, right? So let's say someone says, I want you to project that red vector, which represents this data point here, onto that best fit black vector that you drew earlier. Now, without even knowing what a projection is, I think a lot of people would find it clear that if we imagine like a light source coming from this direction, what does the shadow of that red vector look like on this black vector? In other words, you're taking this red vector and projecting it onto that black vector you drew. The answer would be that it looks like this. It's going in the same direction as this original black vector you drew. It just has a shorter magnitude, right? And we can do similar things for any other one of these data points. For example, here is another data point representable by this red vector right here. And let's say we want to project that red vector onto the original black vector. Now imagine a light source coming from down here, and we see that the projection we get is a shorter version of the original black vector we drew. Okay, so that's all it means to project one vector onto another vector. We basically, uh, geometrically, I mean in as many dimensions as we can draw, which is up to three dimensions, we would take that vector and kind of just project it down. Imagine there's a light source coming from uh, the direction perpendicular to uh, this vector that we're looking at right here and then you see what the shadow of that uh, vector would be on the target vector, okay? So that's kind of a fuzzy, intuitive idea of what a projection means. Now, of course, the question is why would we ever want to do this? I mean, maybe there's some applications to physics, maybe we care about actual literal shadows, but in a more abstract context in data science, why do we care about projecting one vector onto another vector? Well, let's take a look at what happens if we were to successfully project all seven of these original data points onto that black vector we drew right here. Let's look at before we did that. Before we did that, how much pieces of, how much basically variables did we need to store all seven of these data points? Remember, there are seven data points and each one has an x1 variable and an x2 variable. So seven times two means that there was 14 distinct numbers to store for our complete story. So you can see that here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rows and two columns. So there are 14 total numbers to store in our computer or database or wherever in order to get the full picture here. Now let's say we successfully did project each of these seven data points onto uh, this vector here. Uh, let's say this vector is called u. In fact, u is not exactly that vector. It's going to be a unit vector that goes in the same direction, which is a quick tangent, quick side note, uh, is that when you're projecting some vector like this guy onto a target vector, it doesn't matter if you're projecting it on like this target vector or this target vector or this target vector. It just has to be going in the same direction. 
So for example, I could have chosen to project it onto this vector or onto this vector. I would get the same exact answer for my projection in the end. So basically when you're projecting one vector on another vector, the vector you're projecting onto, its magnitude doesn't matter, okay? Because in the end, you're just projecting on a direction, a, a particular direction. So that's why that we can just be safe assuming that we're projecting always on a unit vector u. Going back to this story, before we needed 14 distinct numbers in our database to store this entire story. Now what do we need? Now we basically need the unit vector we're projecting on, so u, which is given by u1 and u2, right, because it lives in two dimensions. So that's two pieces of information. And then the only other pieces of information we need are the multipliers for all the projections. Remember why? Because we know after we project each of these seven data points onto the unit vector, we already know the direction. The direction is the direction of the unit vector. Why? Because that's how projections work. They take a vector and they project it onto a very specific other direction. In this case, the direction being u. The only ambiguity, the only thing we need to track is the magnitude of the projection itself. Remember, it can be short, it can be longer. In fact, it can be even longer than this if there was a point up here, for example. So we just care about the magnitude, which we're going to say is k, k1 through k7 for each of these seven data points. So there are seven magnitudes to store, and there are two components in the u vector to store. So that makes a grand total of nine different, um, nine different variables nine different pieces of information we have to store in our database. So you're saying, okay, we went from 14 to nine, no big deal. Well, yeah, but that's because this was a very toy example. Imagine that you have billions and billions of data points, and maybe they don't live in just two dimensions, they have 10 different dimensions, right? And now you're able to project those 10 dimensions onto maybe two or three dimensions. Um, that can be a substantial gain in computational time, in data storage, Face considerations like that, right? So hopefully you see why uh, vector projections can be a really big deal for us to do things in that nature. It'll become more apparent when we do uh, principal component analysis video and talk about vector projections in that context, okay? Cool, so that is uh, the geometry behind vector projections and why vector projections are important for data science. The last part of this video will be using this geometry to derive the algebra behind vector projections. All right, welcome back. So here is our goal. We have vector x and we want to project it onto vector v. Of course, if we just drew the solution geometrically, that would be the easiest thing ever, right? We know that it's gonna be kind of like, if I drew a perpendicular down, that's a right angle. And then the answer would be this vector starting at the origin, ending right here along the direction of vector v that is my answer. Let's call that answer as P for now. That's the thing we're going to be trying to derive algebraically, find a close form solution for it. Uh, before we do that, let's go back to a concept we talked about earlier, which was that if you project onto a vector, it's the same thing as projecting onto a vector that's longer than it or shorter than it. In our specific case, uh, to make our computations a lot easier, we're going to be asking to project on the unit vector, u, Remember, a unit vector is a vector with length or magnitude 1. We're going to be projecting x onto the unit vector u, which goes in the same direction as v. And you'll see why that makes our computations a little bit easier. First, though, how do we derive that unit vector? Well, that's pretty easy, right? A unit vector is given by the vector divided by the magnitude of that vector. Take a second to think about that. If I take my vector v right here and I divide it by its magnitude, then it's going to have uh, magnitude 1. The resulting vector will have magnitude 1. And of course, it'll be going in the same direction as v, because all I did was take a scalar multiplier of it. Um, if you're not familiar with this double bar notation, this thing just means the magnitude of the vector inside the double bars. OK, so that's vector u is equal to v over magnitude of v. Now, what's the next thing I need to know in order to find the projection? Let's define another vector which secretly lives in this diagram. That's going to be vector d. Vector d is going to be starting right here and going up and ending where vector x ends. Now notice something. Notice that vector p, which is the projection vector, plus vector d, which is this one we just defined, is vector x. So p plus d is equal to x. Okay, convince yourself of that because we start here at p with the rules of vector addition, then we go up d, and that's the same thing as if we had x. So p plus d is equal to x. Let's rearrange that guy a little bit. So we have that d is equal to x minus p. 
Now we're going to do something very clever. We're going to be using this subtle idea of the right angle, which I talked about right here. And we're going to be using this to derive what vector p would have to be. Um, but before we do even that, let's also define p as some multiplier of vector u, right? Because in the end, we know that p is going to be some scalar multiple of vector u because it has to be going in the same direction as the original vector v, which is the same direction as u. It's just a question of what's the scalar multiplier that's going to get attached to it. So p is equal to ku, so that d is equal to x minus ku. Okay, now what we're going to do is enforce that p and d are perpendicular to each other. They just have to be. Because if p was any longer than the actual projection, if it was this long, then d would end up looking like this, and p and d would no longer be perpendicular. If p were any shorter than it should be, d would end up looking like this, and they would no longer be perpendicular either. So the only way this whole projection business works out is if p and d are exactly perpendicular to each other. And we're going to take advantage of that fact. How are we going to take advantage of that fact? We're going to take advantage of that fact by using the dot product. Remember, the dot product of two vectors is equal to 0 if those two vectors are perpendicular to each other. So basically, we want the dot product of which two vectors equal to 0. We're looking at p and d. So p being ku and d being x minus ku. So what I want to do here is actually uh, remove the diagram so I have some space on this side. So we care about the dot product of ku dot, remember this is just p, the dot product of ku and x minus ku, x minus ku, which again is just d. We care about the dot product of p and d being equal to zero. The cool thing about dot products is that they behave just kind of like the way you would expect with uh, distributions and stuff. So we have k dot x I mean, sorry, k, x dot u, k being a scalar, so u dot x is the same thing as x dot u, so I just flip them, minus, that's where this minus distributor comes from, k squared, u dot u has to be equal to zero, okay? So now we can do a lot of simplifications. First of all, there's a factor of k here, a factor of k here, and there's a zero here, so we can safely just remove a factor of k from all sides of the equation. And now, what is u dot u? What is a unit vector dot itself? Well, any vector dot itself just gives us the magnitude of that vector, right? Uh, or magnitude squared of that vector, rather. But since the magnitude of u is just 1, and 1 squared is just 1, this u dot u is just 1, and we can basically just not write it at all. So what we get in the end, after we rearrange this equation, is equal to k is equal to x dot u. And remember, k is what we were looking for the entire time, because k was the multiplier of vector u, which tells us what is the actual projection of vector x onto vector v. Um, so now let's plug in uh, k into the actual formula. So we get p is equal to uh, x dot u. So we get p is equal to x dot u times u. One last substitution to make before we're completely done with this guy. Remember, u is equal to v over magnitude of v. So we get this guy is equal to uh, x dot v over magnitude of v times u. And we can also expand this other u uh, as, v, uh, as the v representation as well. Um, OK, so that's the answer. The projection of vector x onto vector v is given by x dot v over magnitude of v times u, where u is again v over magnitude of v. So the formula looks really, really ugly. I'll give you that. It's not pretty. And that's why a lot of students get confused, because it ends up being one of those concepts you just memorize, you commit to memory, instead of um, thinking about how you got there geometrically. In fact, it took us all this work just to get from the geometric, uh, geometric interpretation to the algebraic interpretation. But the fact that we went through it, the fact that we uh, took the time to devise it, means that we have a better understanding of how these two things are related, right? If we look at this guy, we know that this guy is the multiplier and this guy is the unit vector in the direction of the thing we're projecting on. And where does this come from? We know it came from the fact that the dot product between P and D has to be zero, okay? So that's, in a nutshell, projecting one vector onto another vector. We'll be using this concept in principal component analysis, okay? So until next time.